today is Barbara Mailer, research hydrologist at the USGS Texas Wine Center in Austin, where her research focuses on groundwater quality and geochemistry. Today, the writing and publication of nine USGS circulars published this year on water quality in the principal aquifers of the United States, and presented the results this spring as a congressional briefing. Thank you, Barb, for taking time to share with us today. Let's go ahead and get started. Very much. And, and before I start, um, I would like to say that this, what I'm going to be presenting today is just a very quick take of work that was done uh, over two decades by an enormous number of very dedicated USGS scientists and technicians. Uh, far too many, they would fill up several slides worth of their names. So they are, I'm really just the messenger today, and I'm, I'm representing all the uh, amazing research that they've done over a couple of decades. of groundwater are pumped every day for irrigation industry and is a reliable source of drinking water for millions of people. The groundwater quality program was designed to answer some key questions, including what are in groundwater and how they vary among regions, among aquifers, even in the same aquifer. What processes are going on underground that affect the quality of groundwater as it moves through an aquifer from the point of recharge, the land surface, to the point of discharge, the well or a stream or spring. And finally, how can well managers and operators use information to make decisions and take actions to ensure that the groundwater produced meets human health benchmarks for drinking water? These questions, for the past two decades, the U.S. National Water Quality Assessment Program, or NAQA program, sampled groundwater from more than 6,600 wells and aquifers that supply the vast majority of the nation's groundwater. We analyzed that water for a wide range of constituents, including metals, pesticides, solvents, nutrients, and radionuclides. We used sensitive laboratory methods with visible detection levels. We also gathered information on land use well depth, well time, and other ancillary data to determine what controls the quality of the groundwater that so many people depend on. The sample included those tapping parts of aquifers used for drinking, but also included some shallow monitoring wells underlying agricultural and urban land. Today, we're going to focus on groundwater from parts of aquifers used as a drinking water supply, the blue dot. that of every five samples collected from parts of aquifers used as a drinking water supply, of those five samples, at least one, and sometimes more, contaminants at a concentration of potential concern for human health. Now, these are collected straight from the well before any water treatment. There is water. And concentrations can be lowered to acceptable levels before drinking but that treatment usually comes at a large cost. Now, these are the nationwide average, and there was wide variability among regional aquifers. The upper aquifer, for example, in southeastern U.S., few in 20 samples contain contaminant at a concentration of concern for human health. But as basin-filled aquifers, one every three samples contain at least one contaminant above its human health benchmark concentration. Another also demonstrated that no groundwater quality vary among aquifers. It is within the same aquifer, even among wells located quite close to one another. Provide understanding of why that variability occurs has been a goal of the NACWA groundwater study. Key findings of the NACWA assessments that frankly came as a surprise to me. The first, in most cases where the ground contained a contaminant at a concentration above a human health benchmark, in fact, 80% of the time, the logic source. In other words, the contaminant came from the interaction between water and the rocks 
and sediments that make up the aquifer. In 90% of samples that exceed the benchmark was the commitment associated with human activities. And in the majority of cases, that contaminant was nitrate, a new associated with fertilizer and with human and animal waste. In very few cases did a chemical like a pesticide or a solvent occur in concentration of concern for human health. That's the nationwide average. In some, like the northern Atlantic coastal plain, Hawaii, and the Columbia Plateau, many contaminants exceeded human health benchmarks for drinking water more frequently than did geologic constituents. And in some cases, that contaminant was the pesticide DL children. Further, 290 constituents and properties that the USGS measured for these assessments health benchmarks for only about two-thirds of them. For a third of those 290 constituents, we don't know whether the concentrations measured represent a potential risk for human health or not. And by benchmarks, I'm referring to the maximum contaminant levels, or MCLs, developed by the EPA, and human health benchmarks developed by the USGS in partnership with the EPA. Samples contained more than one constituent, a level exceeding a benchmark, which raises questions about implications of contaminant mixtures for human health. The contaminants were those that occurred most commonly at concentrations of concern. It's tempting when, if most of these contaminants are coming from the aquifer, then there's nothing that we can do about that. Correct. Because the second surprising thing I learned was that in many cases, the way we use our water resources, but in surface water, can only affect the concentrations of these so-called natural contaminants in groundwater. The aqua studies identified five factors that have a great influence on groundwater quality. results of the NAQA studies told about how each of these factors affect contaminant concentrations in groundwater and the influence of human actions on these factors. Long as we're around, there are sources of what we consider contaminant. And these sources are the sediments and rocks that make aquifers. And the aquifer materials contain these elements, such as maize, and radioactive materials like radon and radium and be released into the groundwater. Now we have added considerably to potential sources of groundwater contamination. Human waste, petroleum products, pesticides, and other man made contaminants end up groundwater as a result of human activities at the land surface. Identified by NOCWA studies is climate. Climate change here, but simply whether the climate is arid or humid. Because air temperature and precipitation amounts can affect groundwater quality. In the there's a recharge. As a result, ground enters and moves through the aquifer fairly rapidly. But in semi arid climates where there's little rainfall and a lot of evaporation, there's little recharge. With only a amount of recharge, Groundwater moves slowly through the aquifer, so it has a long time during which it can interact with the aquifer material. Further, repeated cycles of evaporation result in the buildup of salts at the land surface. Come the challenges of climate with the ocean. Humans irrigate our fields, our crops, and even watering of landscape to create artificial recharge. From the point of view of the aquifer, We've altered the climate, and we've actually increased the amount of groundwater that flows through the aquifer. The intended consequence of irrigation is to dissolve all those salts that have been accumulating naturally in the soil over thousands of years, carrying down to the shallow groundwater. In many areas with a semi-arid climate, concentrations of salts or dissolved solids 
in shallow groundwater are high. Those hydrations can be removed through treatment, but at a cost. The osmosis treatment plant was built at a cost of $35 million to remove all solids from shallow groundwater in the Denver area. The tanks that make up an aquifer, the geology, can easily groundwater flows through the aquifer. The glacier system, which gets about the northern one-third of the United States, is made of loose sands and gravels, and groundwater readily flows through these materials. In the first speed by the NACWA program, groundwater flow is through fractured rocks, the basaltic rocks in Hawaii and Washington State. And here, the bulk of the water flow is in the fractures. And in younger aquifers, groundwater flow is through conduits that have delved out of limestone through a type of geology called karst. Aquifer assessed by the NACWA program is the Florida aquifer. The geologic type plays a key role in controlling groundwater quality because the minerals in geologic materials can release elements into the groundwater. Geology is the science that decides in what direction and at what rate groundwater moves through the subsurface is the ultimate source of groundwater. The rain snow that infiltrates into the soil and makes its way down to the water table recharges the aquifer. In this scenario, that water flows through the aquifer and changes into a stream, a spring, or a lake. When we pump water from a well, and especially if we pump high volumes, we change the groundwater flows. The discharge now is from the well, in the vicinity of the well is lowered. Groundwater is being pulled toward the well instead of moving toward the stream. Water stream now moves downward into the aquifer instead of the other way around. This is a vulnerability of public supply wells to contamination determines the direction and rate of groundwater flow is strongly controlled by the presence or absence of conduits and other preferential pathways through which water can flow without impediment. These pathways can range in size from a few sections of an inch to large pipes and even caverns. Studies have also demonstrated how, at a larger scale, the absence of a fining layer has enormous effect on contaminant transport in groundwater is a layer of low permeability material, usually clay, that can protect the underlying confined aquifer from contaminants that infiltrate from the land surface. In this, we've altered the hydrogeology by installing wells that breach a confining layer. Multi-aquifer wells are open to and pump water from both the upper and lower aquifers. The aquifer well isn't being pumped up or down the well from one aquifer to another. So in fact, an official preferential pathway, one that we've created that allows water to short-circuit the confining layer. Our factor is the geometry inside of the aquifer, which controls the geochemical reactions that take place. The NACWA groundwater assessments illustrate fundamental aspect of the geochemistry of an aquifer is called the redox condition. Simply, this is where the groundwater contains dissolved oxygen, is oxic, or which we call anthic. On the left is red because it's coated with iron oxides, and these coat aquifer sediments in oxic water. Call it well. Other elements like arsenic to the iron oxides, which come from the groundwater and decreases concentrations. The same is white because the groundwater is anoxic. In groundwater, the iron oxides stay dissolved in the groundwater along with other trace elements. The repeated found 
the concentrations of trace elements like arsenic and manganese were more likely to occur in anoxic groundwater. Oxic water is good and anoxic water is bad. In fact, a very important and beneficial process occurs only in anoxic groundwater. The transnitrate in the nitrogen gas like we breathe in the atmosphere. Now, in aqua studies show that in anoxic groundwater, nitrogen was rarely detected, even in shallow groundwater under agricultural land where nitrogen-containing fertilizer is intensely used. Chemical conditions like the acidity or pH of the groundwater and alkalinity also affect concentrations of contaminants. That human actions can affect these geochemical conditions, from fertilizer on the land surface to fresh water into the ground. Factors individually can affect groundwater quality. These assessments demonstrate that more commonly, the factors interact in complex ways. We'll take examples that the groundwater studies have identified of how multiple factors interact to affect groundwater quality, the role that human actions play. Come from the NAQA assessments of the High Plains aquifers in the central west, an area that includes the Ogallala aquifer. Remember the aquifer wells? Area, there are hundreds of them, and they have the very high volumes of water needed for irrigation in this region. Our contaminant source is the geology. In this, the aquifer sediments contain uranium. Climate is required to support the intensive agriculture, which is the economic driver in this region. Point of view: the ground is a sequence of aquifers, alternating with confining layers that prevent shallow groundwater from mixing with deep groundwater. What studies found was that the high geology at the local scale has been altered by the multi-aquifer wells. When the water is being pumped, ground can move from the upper aquifer down through the well and mix with groundwater in the lower aquifer. Chemistry comes into our example. Groundwaters in the upper and lower aquifers are geologically distinct. Groundwaters mix down there in the lower aquifer it changes the geochemical conditions and the aquifer sediments to release uranium into the groundwater. Which is for York, Nebraska, about half a mile from the multi aquifer well, there's a pump supply well and it pumps water from that lower aquifer. In the winter, when the well is not pumping, by the public supply well, contains elevated concentrations of uranium released by groundwater mixing. Other activities, such as aquifer storage and recovery, also cause different groundwaters to mix. And mixed groundwaters can cause aquifer sediments to release natural contaminants into the groundwater, but cause man-made contaminants in groundwater to move into the deeper drinking water resource. Was for the high plains, NOCWA studies found that this same type of process, ground contamination through mixing, is occurring in other regional aquifers, including Utah's Salt Lake Valley, the California Valley, and in the Tampa area in Florida. So, just identifying the contamination, but from understanding of the factors that cause it it's about resource managers to come up with solutions, such as rethinking the use of multi-aquifer wells or informed siting of aquifer storage and recovery facilities. In the second example, in the glacial aquifer, well digging causes induced infiltration. This is from the aquifer system in the northern U.S., and it illustrates how our choice 
choice of where supply wells are sited affect the quality of the water pumped. Of the Corn Belt region of the glacial aquifer in the Midwest, is that glacial soils are fertile but relatively impermeable. That charge does not readily infiltrate into the soils. It ponds. More suitable for agriculture, works of artificial drains called tile drains have been installed across the corn belt to remove excess water from the root zone. And pests and fertilizers are applied to the land surface to be explained away by the tile drains. So the don't infiltrate down into the groundwater. The nutrients of this region found that despite intensive fertilizer and pesticide application rates in the corn belt, the water is relatively uncontaminated. Water in the tile drains and the nutrients and pesticides it carries into ditches, which ultimately flow to streams and rivers. Now, many areas are sited near streams or rivers because it increases the amount of groundwater that can be pumped. When the water is pumped, it alters the natural geology. Instead of flowing toward the stream, flowing water from the stream through the subsurface toward the well. Aqua studies in the Corn Belt region found that concentrations of pesticides and nutrients in groundwater pumped from public supply wells sited near streams were higher than in other the study demonstrated that concentrations of pesticides and nutrients were particularly high when the timing of pest and fertilizer application coincides with storms that increase the amount of runoff. Identification of the problem and the factors causing the problem lead to a potential solution. By asking what's causing the contamination, water supply can time their pumping to avoid higher concentrations of nutrients and pesticides. Our example illustrates the important role that groundwater plays in surface water quality. Many realize that when it's not actually raining and there's no surface water runoff, the stream is coming from groundwater discharge, what's called base flow. As a result, groundwater can be a major contributor of nutrients, salts, pesticides, and other contaminants to streams. An example of this in the Denver Basin Aquifer System in Colorado. The NACWA studies identified a situation where all five of our factors, and humans have altered them, groundwater could be a source of high concentrations of selenium to Gate Creek near Aurora, Colorado. Now the excuse me, the US Forest Service reported in the nineties that selenium causes skeletal deformities and mortality in animals, birds, and fish. You may be familiar with selenium contamination, a publicized case of deformed birds at the Ken National Wildlife Refuge in California. Now sources the geology. The aqua rocks are volcanic ash, which contains selenium. A caused by the semi-arid climate has caused for thousands of years the selenium to become concentrated in layers. Because of the semi-arid, landscape watering provides much greater volumes of recharge than existed historically. That brings oxygenated water, air chemistry, it brings oxygenated water into contact with the selenium soils, dissolving the selenium. It also changed the hydrogeology. For resources in the Denver Basin, the water was low, and Toll Creek frequently was a source of recharge to the aquifer. But that's never first. The annual recharge from irrigation has the water table to rise. To the point where water now discharges into the creek, providing a round base flow. The cost of selenium 
contributed by groundwater to Tollgate Creek are enough that they exceed the aquatic life criteria for selenium in Colorado. This many situations identified by the NOCWA studies of how this water quality can be affected by groundwater. Another important example is Chesapeake Bay. Tributary streams to Chesapeake Bay were more than half their nitrogen from groundwater. Now, I'd like to show you how the NACWA studies of the North Atlantic Coastal Plain, the official aquifer system in the northeastern United States, identified how the use of chemicals at the land surface can exhibit concentrations of a contaminant with a geologic source with importance for drinking water. Analyzed samples of groundwater in parts of the social aquifer for radium. Radium drinking water has been documented, documented by the CDC as associated with bone and nasal cancers. One sample uh, program tested contained radium at a concentration of concern for human health. Our here is the geology itself, the sediments that make up the aquifer. Because even though radium has a geologic source, radiations were higher in agricultural areas. Let's see what it might be. The coastal plain aquifer is made up of quartz, silt, and sand. So, hypothetically, the aquifer is very permeable. Rain, which is naturally acidic, readily infiltrates into and through the aquifer sediments. It's not that these sediments contain an unusually high amount of radium. It's radium is soluble if the geotons are acidic. Quartz sediments have little capacity to bear the acidity in rainwater. The ground also is acidic. It has a pH of about 5.3 on average, and radium therefore dissolves into the groundwater. Humans contribute to this process. In cultural areas, nitrogen containing fertilizers are used. And nitrogen makes its way into the groundwater. With, because water is oxic, the nitrogen is transformed to nitrate. And the formation releases hydrogen ions, which makes the water even more acidic. In agricultural areas, lime is commonly added to the soil to try to buffer the acidity. The magnesium ions in the lime cause more radium to be released from the sediments through an ion exchange process. Now, supply wells under the Safe Drinking Water Act are required to monitor for contaminants like radium on a regular basis and to take to reduce any concentrations that exceed the MCL. But remember, it's expensive. Water suppliers in the northeastern U.S. have been required to install costly treatment facilities. In Vineland, New Jersey, a treatment facility was constructed to remove rain from groundwater from three wells at a cost of a million dollars per well for 5,000 people of private or domestic wells is not typically required, but the U.S. discovery of widespread elevated concentrations of radium in domestic wells and its causes in the Atlantic coastal plain has created new guidelines for monitoring in parts of New Jersey and Maryland where radium is known to occur. Here, homeowners can reduce concentrations of radium with a water softener system. of how the NACWA assessments of groundwater quality over the past two decades to explain the complexities of where and why some elements occur in groundwater at concentrations of concern for human health. Many in-depth assessments and examples are provided by nine newly published USGS circulars. 
describe differences in geology, hydrology, geostry, and chemical use for millions of the nation affect aquifer vulnerability to contamination. Summarized in U.S. Circular 1360, why in principal aquifers of the United States. How informed local communities and water managers address these issues? Not the public supply well vulnerability to contamination have led to three factors that can water managers determine which contaminants in an aquifer might reach a public supply well, when, how, and what concentration. First is the nation of the air that provides recharge to a well. And this can include computer models of groundwater flow and interpretation of differences and similarities of groundwater chemistry in space and time. With potential sources within the charge area can be inventoried. Is determination of chemical processes going on in the aquifer? The approach to determine this include the redox condition, the pH, and the alkalinity of the groundwater pump. And the determination of the age of the groundwater, or the mix of ages. Yonsently recharged groundwater is more likely to contain chemicals and the aquifer for hundreds or even thousands of years is likely to contain contaminants with geologic sources. To understand the mix of ages of groundwater pumped from a well include chemical age tracers such as isotopes and chlorofluorocarbons. Knowledge of these three measures of contaminant sources, aquifer geochemistry, and groundwater age can be a powerful tool for water resource managers to determine where contaminant concentrations are likely to be elevated. Public supply well might respond to contamination, or how does it take for water quality to respond to source water protection efforts? These and additional factors that affect the vulnerability of public supply wells to contamination are explained in USGS Circular 1385. In groundwater studies, we found that by putting all the pieces together. The hydrogeology and the chemistry, we can actually use statistical methods to predict where many contaminants are likely to occur in groundwater and even estimate at what concentrations. In fill aquifers, for example, geology, climate, and hydrologic setting are key to predicting where arsenic is likely to be present in groundwater at concentrations of concern for human health, shown in orange. Vision is immensely useful for water resource managers who would love to determine the location, quantity, and quality of water resources available in this water scarce region. And this simple focuses of the NAQA groundwater quality studies over this, this decade with the development of large-scale regional models that went to these kinds of predictive maps for a range of contaminants for aquifers across the United States. A of current NAQA assessments is the continued sampling of groundwater, but with an emphasis on the deep water resource that is the source of most of our public drinking supply distributed across entire regional aquifers and will provide a three-dimensional picture of groundwater quality. The major focus of ongoing NAQA studies is to understand how groundwater quality might be changing. Drought, regeneration, pot growth, agricultural practices, the brawl, all expected to affect not just groundwater quantity, but water quality as well. 
as part of the first two decades of the program, NOAA collected some samples of shallow groundwater underlying agricultural and urban land. In those levels, we have higher concentrations of man-made chemicals than in the deeper parts of aquifers used for drinking water. Those might find their way down into that deeper drinking water resource. Currently is resampling more than 2,000 wells to gain an understanding of not just what's in the groundwater, but how that quality is changing and why. So with some insights on uh, results of the first two decades of the NAQA groundwater quality program, and also a taste of current assessments and solutions for the next decade. Improve understanding of the factors that affect groundwater quality and the impact of human actions needs us more wisely developed and protect the nation's groundwater, our and vital resources. Thank you for your attention, and at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.